You notice that video said Explore God at the end, and some of you have been hearing about this. We're starting in January, a service called Explore God with over 800 churches around the Chicagoland area, and we're going to be engaging our neighbors in conversations and preaching through seven big questions about life, and that's a sample. That, that video was taken off of their website. There's a sample of the kind of resources they provide for you and uh, your neighbors to explore who God is, and there's, you can type in in their search bar almost anything and find really great resources on prayer, on the Bible, on who God is, on what life means. And so, anyway, we encourage you to pray for that, and we'll be talking about that as we go. I forgot something a moment ago to tell you about. Uh, as you came in, maybe you saw these. You can get them as you leave. We produce these a couple times a year, a neighboring magazine. Uh, this is our Advent version. We've done this a couple times now. This is like the third year, I think, we've done this. This is outstanding. I'm always impressed with... Uh, I, I, it sounds like I'm saying impressed with me. I don't mean that. <laughs> I mean, with what our staff produces, written by our own staff, ideas for how to uh, serve your family, lead them in devotions, and focus on Christ this Advent season, and ideas for how to love your neighbor well during the Advent season. So you won't want to miss this. Pick one of these up as you leave. They're available for you, uh, one per family. That video talked about prayer. How do you do it? Knowing if we're doing it right. If you've been with us, you know we're in a series called With Jesus. And we've been trying to learn what it means to be, live our lives with Jesus. When Jesus calls his disciples to follow them, it's not a part-time thing, a nine-to-five thing, a sometime thing. It's to live your life with him 24-7. And this last little segment inside of this series all fall is called Praying with Jesus. What does the prayer life of a disciple look like? And last week we talked about how not to pray, what Jesus taught us not to do when we pray. We're going to flip it now and look at what he tells us to do as we pray. It's natural to want to talk to God. I quoted last week, Martin Buber says, the inclination of the human heart is prayer. It's the natural reflex reaction of the human soul. It's also natural and normal to wonder if you're doing it right. You ever wondered that? If, if I'm praying right, am I getting it right? Is he hearing me? You ever feel like you're praying to the wall when you pray? Is anybody there? We have come to refer to as the Lord's Prayer is actually... The answer Jesus gave to his disciples in Luke 11, they hear him praying, and they're so moved by his prayer, they say, Lord, teach us to pray that way. I don't know if you've ever had that experience where you hear somebody praying and you're so compelled that you feel, I want that relationship with God. I want to know God the way they do because I can see it and sense it and hear it in their prayer. Well, the disciples heard that from Jesus, and they asked him, teach us to pray that way. And the Lord's Prayer, or maybe you grew up calling it the Our Father, is Jesus' answer to that question. Pray this way. And we're going to go through that this morning in detail. Perhaps along with Psalm 23 and maybe John 3.16, it's the best known passage in all the Bible. The Lord's Prayer. But what does it really mean? I, I would suspect that even though it's well known by most of us, few of us really understand its depth and what it means. Martin Luther wrote this in his book on prayer. He says, how many pray the Lord's Prayer a thousand times in the course of a year? And if they were to keep on doing so for a thousand years, they still would not have really tasted it. The Lord's Prayer is the greatest martyr on earth. So many torture and abuse it. And so few take comfort and joy in its proper use. That's what we're after then this morning. How, what's the right way to understand the Lord's Prayer and the right way to make it part of our lives? Perhaps you grew up in a tradition where you just repeat it often, as many times as you can. Like magic words, like an incantation. Jesus has really given us an incredible gift in this prayer. So let's read the passage and we'll try to make sense of it together. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through verse 15. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Again, I think you could make the case, and we will try to, that Jesus has given us the the synopsis of everything we need to live life with him in this prayer. But they're not magic words. What he's not given us is the magic words. If you say this enough times and you really mean it, great things will happen. Few of you would say that, but I think sometimes we grow up thinking that. If I say it right, if I do it right. Jesus has not given us a formula, a, a formula for prayer. 
like a magic formula. He's given us what you might call a framework. So not a formula. And there's a huge difference between formula and framework. And we'll try to explain that. He's given a framework, how to frame our own prayer life, which is not to say it's wrong to repeat this prayer as it stands. That's a great thing. It's a great place to start. But if we start thinking that all we have to do is just say these words and really mean them, we're, we're in danger of violating what Jesus told us not to do in the passage right before this. If you were here last week, and if you weren't, you can get all the sermons available on our church app or on the website. But last week we talked about, he says, don't babble on like the pagans. They think they'll be heard because of their many words, meaning They think that the secret to prayer is getting the words right to impress God with your theological acumen and your vocabulary. As if God's in heaven going, whoa, did you hear what she said? That was impressive. So it's not a formula that we just follow it, life will work out, but it's a framework for how to understand our own prayer life. We'll talk about that. The first thing about this framework is that it is basically divided into two sections if you think about it. And I had not really noticed this before, but as I was thinking about it this week, the first section of the prayer focuses on God's name, God's kingdom, and God's will. It's vertical. The first section is focused vertically on who God is, what he's all about, and why that matters. And the next section focuses on bread, forgiveness, and deliverance from temptation. The next section is focused horizontally, And as I was praying about this sermon and thinking about it, it occurred to me that this division of the prayer reflects something else Jesus said in Matthew 22, verses 37 to 39, when he was asked what the greatest commandment in all of Scripture was. And his answer is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. We talk about being a neighborhood church around here. It's right out of this verse. But you can see the Lord's Prayer, love for God and love for neighbor. It's broken up this way. It's vertically focused on who God is, and it's horizontally focused on how we live with each other in the world. And the order matters. The order matters in Jesus' commandment, and the order matters in in this prayer he gave us. How many of you, if you're honest, we don't get the order right sometimes? When I pray, I'm tempted to go right to my needs, right to the stuff I want, right to the stuff that's troubling me. We, go, we just make it, we get our list, we go right to our list. And the one thing Jesus is saying to begin with is, don't start there. Start vertically. Start with who God is. I remember teaching my kids to pray at night, you know, and there would be the, a, a thank you list. Some of your kids, remember the parents, remember your kids doing this, right? Thank you for mommy, thank you for daddy, thank you for Benji, thank you for Noah, thank you for... And then Benjamin would always peek and look around his room. Thank you for monster trucks, and thank you for Legos, and thank you for dinosaurs, and like all the things he would see in his room. Just thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm like, all right, just thank you for everything, and let's go to bed, you know? We make our list, we get right to it. But the order is not accidental. Prayer begins with God. If you feel the urge to pray, it's because his spirit is prompting you. And so when we pray, we begin with who he is. Reflecting on who he is. Think about this. Jesus is saying, every time you pray, daily, spend time focusing your mind and your heart on who God is. Do you do that when you pray? Do you spend extended periods of time thinking about who God is? How merciful and loving and gracious and good and faithful he is? Or do you just get right to the things that are stressing you out? So let's do this for a moment. Look at verse 9, Matthew 6, 9. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The first thing we see that's radical in this idea of prayer is, it's easy for us to miss, is that Jesus says, pray our Father. We talked about this a little bit last week. For Jews in Jesus' day, they thought of God, Yahweh, as Father only in the sense of he's Father of the nation of Israel father of the Jews, or father of all creation, the source, the origin of all life. They thought of him as father in general terms like that. They did not speak of him or think of him as personal, intimate father. When Jesus says this, pray our father, he's using intimate language for daddy. That would have been shocking in that day. But the first thing he says to us is, when you pray, make sure you know who you're talking to. 
And it's so easy to get that wrong, to think of God as a cosmic absentee landlord. You're not sure if he's even paying attention. Or as an angry stepfather in the sky who's unpredictable and might zap you if you, if you step out of line. Jesus says, when you pray, slow your heart down and think about who he is. He's your father. He's your good father. And I said this last week, but even if you grew up with a not so good earthly father, your desire and longing for someone better is evidence that you know what a good father is. And that's who God is. Our good father. That's a radical thing. The very first thing Jesus says is, you must understand who you're talking to. A.W. Tozer in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, says the most important fact about any of us is what comes into our minds when we think about God. Think about that for a minute. The most important fact about your life is your conception of who God is. If you think of God as an absentee landlord, then that impacts how you live. If you think God doesn't exist, that impacts how you live. If you think of God as like the Santa Claus in the sky, it impacts how you live. I want my understanding of God to be shaped by what he says in his word so I come to a more and more increasingly accurate understanding of my father. So you know who you're talking to. Every time you pray, you need, above all, to remind yourself of who he is because you forget who you're talking to. How many of our goofy ideas about God could be sorted out if we just spent time thinking about him as our father? Then Jesus tells us next that to pray God's name be hallowed. Hallowed be your name. I bet you pray that a lot of times in your life, out loud or to yourself. Do you know what hallowed means? What what does that mean? Hallowed? We say, when's the last time in conversation you used the word hallowed this week? That's right. I'm guessing none, zero, right? What does it mean? It comes from the root word holy, sacred, set apart. Well, isn't God already holy? Why does he need me to hallow him? I mean, isn't he holy without me telling him so? Why do I have to pray that? Here's what Jesus is really saying. Hallowed be your name is biblical language for God's reputation on earth. Those of us who've reoriented our life based on who he is and turned over our life to his son Jesus to follow him, what he's asking us to pray is this. God, I want people to know you are their father. I want people to see you for who you really are. I want your name to be known and your reputation to be great and good because you are great and good. It matters to me so much that other people know you the way I know you. So I pray for that. Rather than people dismiss you, ignore you, think about it for a minute. Do you believe God made you in his image? Do you? I know you don't normally do anything when the pastor asks you, you just stare at me until it's over, but you cannot, right? (laughs) Do you believe that he loves you, that he died for you, that he wants a relationship with you? Do you believe that about all people? So what we're praying, we pray, God, how would be your name? We're saying the people who you made in your image and who you love and who you died for, may they come to know you. May they come to know your name as you know theirs. That's a pretty powerful prayer. But you can skip right over, right? How would be your name, whatever that means. I want your reputation on earth to reflect your glory, God. Not people who ignore you, say false things about you, defame you. And sometimes that's our fault because we live in a way that doesn't bring glory to his name. But that's a powerful thing to pray. To pray, God, you're my father, and I want people to know you that way, know your name. Psalm 135, verse 13. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout all ages. There's a prayer. Your name's going to endure, so I want people that you made in your image to know you. Then Jesus says, pray, your kingdom come. We used to say that, right, until kingdom come. That's where it comes from. To kingdom come, until kingdom come, comes from this prayer. What does that mean? Matthew 6, verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This, by the way, is how you hallow God's name. This is how God's name is revered. This is how his reputation is made known and good in the world, by praying that his kingdom comes. 
Now, if you don't know what the kingdom means, we don't have time to get into that. Uh, several weeks ago, we talked about with Jesus understanding the kingdom. And again, you can go back and look at that sermon and listen to it. It, it basically means bringing all of life, all of life on earth under the rule and reign of Jesus as king, starting with you and me. It's one thing to pray, Lord, your kingdom come out there for those people who so desperately need it. For those poor Democrats, for those idiot Republicans. Lord, your kingdom come for those people, for those poor Packer fans this year. We need, they need your kingdom so badly. <laughs> right, we, we pray it out there. But I, Jesus is saying, basically, start here. Bring all of my life under your rule and reign. Bring all of my heart under your rule and reign. Let's start here. That's how your kingdom comes. Bring all of me, my finances, my family, my business, my marriage, my relationships, my school, whatever, I'm in, whatever I'm, you've given me, God, bring it all underneath your rule and reign. That's kingdom come. You know, I think some of us have grown up thinking about like the, the message of the kingdom and the Bible and heaven and earth like this. Like, okay, this is earth. And this is heaven. And, um, you know, God sent his son, right? So God is here, the Trinity in heaven, and he sends his son Jesus to earth to die for our sins and then like in this cosmic biblical spaceship to take us back out of earth to heaven because earth's going to blow up or burn up or something I don't know but he's rescuing us out of the corrupted polluted earth I've said this before but I have a friend who says that too many Christians view life on earth like going into a public restroom at a gas station you go in you do what you have to do you touch as little as possible and you get out as soon as possible right well it's bad the bad the bad world that's not the biblical the bible's message that's a biblical notion He's not, Jesus wasn't sent here to rescue us and take us out. The actual notion of the kingdom is very different. It's heaven and earth are not separate spheres. They overlap. Now they overlap in part. Eventually they'll overlap perfectly. And that Jesus comes, and the whole message of the Bible is this movement. is heaven taking over earth in my life and heart and in the world. And someday that'll be fully realized. So pray your kingdom come, that heaven would rule and reign. And all of life, my life, my family's life, all of life would come under your rule and reign. That's what I want to see, God. That's what I long for, God. You said it will happen, and we see it only in part now. But it's not, I'm just hanging on until you take me out of here. It's you're bringing more and more of your goodness and justice and mercy and peace and grace into my life and into this world. And that's what I pray for. This is Jesus' main announcement, by the way. And it's not new with him. In Zechariah 14, verse 9, we read these words. This is the same thing, right? And the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one, kingdom and name combined. Your name hallowed, your kingdom come, all the earth under your rule. If you want to live your life with Jesus, Jesus is saying that should be at the, at the focus of your prayer. How often is it not for me? I go right to the, the things that I feel I need and lack and want. And there's a place for that, but I don't start with your kingdom come in my life. In fact, if I pray that first, it sorts out some of the other things that I'm worried about. So has God's kingdom come? Yes. Jesus came. Has, it, has all of life become fully under his rule and reign? Not yet. Has God's kingdom come in your own heart? In your own life. If you're a Christian, yes, it's called the Holy Spirit. It's come into you. But it's all of your life and your mind and your thoughts and your actions under his rule and reign? Not yet. This is what theologians call the already not yet idea of the kingdom. It's already here because of Jesus. He's king, but it's not yet fully realized. And so we pray for it. We pray for it. And Jesus says every day, pray for it. Ask him for it. Then he says, your will be done. How many of you would like to know God's will? Who would like to know what God's will is? Show of hands. 
<laughs> if your hand's not up, you're like not listening probably, right? <laughs> we all want to know God's will. And most of us think of it in terms of like, like where, what job I should take, what person I should marry, what car I should drive, what house I should buy. Like I want to know God's will for the things that are right in front of me. And I'm not saying that God doesn't have a specific will for those things, but that's not on the, in the prayer so much. It's not Jesus' primary concern. He has made his will known to us. His will is less concerned with your geography and your job, specific job, and more concerned with your heart and your life and your place in this world. I used to think of God's will as like um, the center of the bullseye, right? Like God is the cosmic game show host. That's how I used to think. And there are three doors. Behind door number one is my specific will for your life. Behind door number, door number two, mm, it's not exactly what I planned, but it's not terrible. And door number three, ooh, let's not talk about door number three. That's bad, right? And God's in heaven going, do, 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 and seeing which one will this poor fool pick. Oh, door number two, well, I'll see you in heaven, right? You know, like, and, I, and, and it's paralyzing. You get nervous, like, I don't want to make the wrong call here. God, is this right? Is this right? I've come to see that's not how God's will is. In the Bible, when you find people in the scriptures that God has a specific will for, Jonah, go to Nineveh. Paul, go to the Gentiles. Moses, go back to Egypt. It's, it's clear, right? They know what God's will is. They don't want to do it, but they know what it is. So God's not making them guess. There's no place in Scripture where God has a specific will for your life, and he's making you guess. If there's a center of the bullseye, he'll tell you. You might not like to hear it, but he'll tell you. But most of our lives are not that way. Most of our lives are not the center of the bullseye thing I have to figure out. Most of our lives are God is saying, seek first my kingdom, my righteousness. Align your heart with who I am, my character, my holiness, and then choose, and I'm with you. Live. Make wise choices. Be loving and gracious. Seek justice. Love mercy. Act, walk humbly. Right? You have cho a choice to make. You have relative freedom inside of my world to make choices. Not everything has to be a paralyzing decision about oh, what's God's will. I think we can trust God that if there's a specific thing he wants us to do, he will tell you. And by the way, he has. He has. Not what car to drive, but how you should live. So when you pray, your kingdom come and your will be done, you're praying about that. God, align my heart with your will. Isn't this Jesus' prayer in the garden? Specifically, Lord, I don't, Father, I don't want to go through with this. But not my will, yours. Notice that Jesus tells us to pray for God's will to be done before we start talking about daily bread and forgiveness and deliverance and our requests. That's pretty instructive, I think. Before you get to your specific immediate needs, align your heart to his will for you in the world. To act justly to love mercy, and to walk humbly with him. Praying for God's will to be done is a prayer of surrender, really. Remember who God is. He's your father, right? Dads for a minute, and moms too, but specifically fathers. What happens when your four-year-old comes to you and asks you for something that you know is not good because it'll electrocute them and kill them or whatever? You know, you just think, you know it's not a good idea. What do you say to them? Well, because you love them, you say, sure, go ahead, son. Right? See how this turns out. No. You say no. And what do you four-year-olds generally do? I mean, maybe your kids are an exception. What do other people's four-year-olds do? Right? <laughs> they freak out and melt down, don't they? Because they think what? They know what they need, and their father won't give it to them. That's what's happening here. We're spiritual four-year-olds in a way, right? God, you're my father. You're my good father. And I'm stressed out about some stuff, but you know what I need. And so your will be done even if I don't like it, even if it's hard for me at times. This is what the Apostle Paul tells us to do in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. This passage was given to me when I was a sophomore in college by a guy who was a mentor and encourager to me in the football team, and I've, it's been important to me ever since, and I think many of you will know it by heart. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, in view of who God is, in other words, give your, present your bodies, that just means give your whole life, as a living sacrifice to him. Holy and acceptable. This is your spiritual act of worship. Worship isn't showing up once a week and singing songs, doing a little church duty now and then. It's give your whole life over to God who's given his whole life for you. And then when you do that, 
you'll be able to discern God's will. See the beauty in that, the wisdom in that? As you surrender, as you lay your life down, as you pray this daily, God, I want to lay my stuff down. I want to surrender to you. You become more and more able to discern and clarify what God's will is. But most of us would like it the other way around, wouldn't we? I'd like to know your will and then make some, uh, you know, some evaluations of my own, some cost-benefit analysis, and decide if I will surrender. (laughs) It's not how it works. It's not how it works for any of us. So think about what Jesus is saying to us to pray daily. God, you're my father, my good father. I relate to you as your child. I want your name to be greater than my name, your name to be great in the world by those who you've made in love. I want your kingdom, more and more of your rule and reign to come into my own heart and into this world. And I want your will, not my will. You could stop right there and be a pretty good prayer. That's the first half of the prayer. Pray every day that God's your father, that his kingdom is real, that he wants you to put your life under his rule and reign. Every day. Now we get to the second half, the horizontal part. Jesus says three things we should pray for. Bread, forgiveness, and help or deliverance. These are categories, and we'll talk about them. First, Matthew 6, 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, we don't see this immediately unless you're familiar with the whole story of the Bible. It's easy to miss. But for Jesus' listeners, Jews, hearing this, they would immediately understand daily bread. They get this reference. This is a reference to what? What story in the Old Testament where God's people depended on God for daily bread? In the Exodus, manna from heaven. I learned from a guy, a Bible scholar named Tim Mackey, that the word manna, well, not from him, but I heard it first from him, that the word manna uh, means um, what? <laughs> like, in Hebrew, it literally means what? Manna. It's like they saw this weird bread on the ground every morning, went, manna. Like, what is that? It's bread from heaven. I think that's funny that it's manna means what? <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> so you depend every day for your what? Your bread from heaven. For like all your provision. This is so hard to do in our culture. I grew up hearing from my grandfather, my uncle, a little bit from my dad, you know, nothing's free in this world, son. No free lunch. You gotta earn everything you get. Jesus says, actually, no. Actually, everything you get comes from your father. Everything you have. Everything you have. Everything you're wearing right now, everything you're going to drive home in and you're going to go home to, all the things that are on order from Amazon on their way to your house, all the stuff that you're going to acquire and give and receive, everything, everything, everything is from your Father. Do you see your life that way? I don't always see my life that way. Do you see your life as pure gift, pure grace? Do you see your everyday existence as dependent on your Father? That's the point of manna. It rots and goes bad if you try to hoard it. So you can eat it and share it, but it goes away and you need it the next day. And most of us in this culture don't live with a daily worry about where our bread's coming from. I see some people that come to our our Shepherd's Heart Ministries that are closer to that, but most of us, I'm guessing most of you in this room, are not worried about whether or not you'll eat today. Do you know that the world of seven billion people could be divided into thirds, and a third of those Three, three point whatever billion people in the world today will eat for sure tomorrow. They're not even worried about it. We're in that third. The middle third will wake up tomorrow and it's a 50-50 proposition if they'll have a meal. They might eat, they might not. And the last third, 3.3 billion people, 3.3 billion people, it's a certainty statistically they won't eat tomorrow. And they know it. Now it's not always the same third in that last two thirds, right? But think about that for a minute. That's the world we live in. And we live in the top third. We don't even think about that daily bread. But Jesus says, pray as if your very existence depends on God, because though you forget it, it does. Because though your, our culture tends to, to convince you otherwise, it does depend on him. And everything you have is a gift of his grace. When you pray, give us this day our daily bread. Nothing I, nothing I have is mine by right or purely by my effort or because I earned it. It's because, God, you've been so gracious to me. Help me see it that way. Help me live that way. This is Jesus. We'll skip over John 6. Skip to that verse because I've already been long-winded. But John 6, 32 to 35, go read that tonight. It's awesome. He, Jesus is saying he's our provision himself when he talks about bread from heaven. 
Then Jesus says that we are not only to pray for daily bread, but also for daily forgiveness. Think about that. Every day when you pray, God, you're my good father. Your kingdom is real. I want to bring my life under your rule and reign. I depend on you for bread every day. And every day I need to be reminded that I'm forgiven. You need that? Every day you need to pray that God, by his spirit, would remind you, you are forgiven. You're forgiven. Think about that for just a minute. You're forgiven. Because of Christ, you're forgiven. You carry around shame and baggage and hurt and wounds, and God is saying, I forgave that. I died for that. And every day, multiple times a day, because you forget it, you need to be reminded in prayer, you're forgiven. Forgive us our debts, our sins, our wounds, and help us to be forgiving. These things go together. That's why I added that last part that Jesus puts after the prayer. He's not changing the subject. Let's read 12 through 15 again of the Lord's Prayer in the passage right after. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That sounds harsh, doesn't it? The main thing Jesus is saying here is every day you need to be reminded that you're forgiven and free. And to the degree that you know that, it frees you to forgive those who have hurt you, those who wrong you, in small little things and in large things. To forgive. What is forgiveness? Forgiveness is not pretending it didn't happen. Forgiveness is not sweeping under the rug and ignoring the offense. Forgiveness is absorbing the pain, giving that to your Father in heaven who can handle it, and releasing your right to get even, which is precisely what Jesus did on the cross. He absorbed the pain, and he released his divine right to punish you and me. When we forgive, we do the same thing because it's been done for us. And in verses 14 and 15, Jesus is not saying that if you struggle to forgive, your God won't forgive you. If it's hard for you to forgive, God won't forgive you. He's not saying that. He's saying if you refuse, if you repeatedly refuse and withhold forgiveness from other people who have hurt you, that's saying something about your heart, that you don't understand grace. You're missing out on a central primary message of the kingdom, which is grace and forgiveness. I know some of you have been holding on to unforgiveness for a long time. And it's just caused this corrupted part of your heart. Every day, pray, God, I'm forgiven. I know I'm forgiven. Help me to release this. Help me to lay this down. It's not the same thing as reconciliation. That takes two people. Forgiveness only takes one. God offers you forgiveness in Christ. You can receive that or not. Okay, then Jesus says, if you pray daily, basically, think about, okay, let's just, for a minute, if every day you prayed, God, you're my good father. God, I want your name to be great in this world because that's how who you are. God, I want your rule and reign to come over all of my life and all of this world. I want your will to be done in me. God, I know I depend on you every day for everything. God, I know I'm forgiven and I'm free. Help me to forgive other people. If you pray that, it'll change you. It'll change you. Not magic overnight, but you'll begin to see the world differently and live differently in the world. And what Jesus says then is, if that happens to you, you will inevitably face opposition, struggle, difficulty, temptation. This is the part about deliver us from evil. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. When Jesus was, what are the two big times Jesus was tested or tempted? Multiple times, but the two big ones are in the wilderness for 40 days, remember that? And in the Garden of Gethsemane. And if you could boil those temptations down, they come down to basically, are you gonna be faithful and humble and obedient to the will of the Father or not? Or are you gonna shortcut it? And it's the same thing for us. Jesus is saying, when you live this way, when you pray this way, you'll live this way. And when you live this way, you're gonna be tempted and, tr and tested and challenged not to be obedient to the will of the Father. So we pray, God, lead me not in temptation, but deliver me. 
In other words, make me the kind of person who can handle trials and temptations without freaking out, without falling apart, without my faith crumbling. Make me the kind of man or woman who can face life, which is not easy, and still know who you are, and still love you, and still serve you. I, we could go on and on, but I won't. <laughs> this is such an incredible, I think Jesus has given us everything we really need to follow him in this prayer. Who God is, who we are in light of who he is, what this world is, what our future is, how we're to live in this world, what, how dependent we are, how gracious we should be because of how he's been gracious to us. It's all in there. It's not magic words, but it's how we should frame our prayer. God, you're my father. God, I forget it, but your kingdom is real. God, bring my life under your rule and reign. God, let your will be done in my life. I want your name to be revered by people who you made and love. God, I, I forget this, but I, everything I have is from you and I depend on you. God, I've been forgiven. So help me to be forgiving. And God, guide me, lead me, so that I'll be the kind of person who can go through life as hard as it is and still love you and give you praise. I don't think there's a better way for us to finish than by reciting this as to close. As I said, it's not magic words. But as you pray this prayer, let's stand together. And we're going to pray it as it will be on the screen. There's different versions of it. We'll pray this version together. I invite you to, pr to reflect on these words, the truth of them, and your relationship with Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen indeed. Go in peace.